Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Welcome back to the Special Education and Advocacy Podcast with Ashley Burlow. I'm Ashley Burlow, and I'm so happy you're here. Oh my gosh, today we're talking about my favorite topic. We're talking about negotiation and advocacy. The title of this episode is A No-Fail Negotiation Strategy That I Learned from Jack Barlow. And let me tell you, Jack is one of the most effective negotiators, one of the most effective advocates that I have ever met in my entire life. And there's no secret as to why this is. It's because Jack is a really, really empathetic kid with an extremely high emotional intelligence. Jack connects to people. He draws people in. He really is a people person. This is a little complicated, by the way, because Jack also has social anxiety that has set in. So up until the age of about, I don't know, 11 or 12, this was really, really obvious. Now it's very, very complicated because Jack connects with people and he draws people in and he wants to be with people, but his social anxiety kind of gets in his way. And in essence, you know, sometimes I say he doesn't do himself a ton of favors, but it's his anxiety that gets in the way and kind of affects his ability to be able to hang in there in the conversations from start to finish. Super interesting to watch. And I have the advantage of having watched nearly every second of his life leading up to this anxiety phase. And that is a huge advantage at helping him through it as well. But anyway, what we're really talking about today is we're talking about negotiation through the lens of this EU, through the lens of interpersonal relationships or the connection that you get when you are interacting with people. And I think that's a huge tip. So when we're negotiating with people, what we have to remember is that we are interacting with people, with humans that have emotions and experiences and knowledge and this entire kind of suitcase of baggage that they've brought along with us. And this is what Jack is so, so good at doing. He's so good at just connecting with the people. So I want to tell you a little story. I don't know if I've ever told this story before here on the podcast. I certainly tell it quite a bit because it's really powerful and it can be used in so many different layers of the work that I do. and you know, connections that I have with friends in the disability community, et cetera. So if you heard this, just bump ahead a few, a few 30 second cycles. It might take me two or three minutes to, to tell this to you. So I have a friend, his name is Chad. He is a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. And Chad has Down syndrome. He is about my age. He is just a total, you know, what we would call a rock star in the Down syndrome community. He's got a rocking job. He's just like rocking it at life. And Chad, actually, there was an article about him and his job when I had Jack. And so I kind of always wanted to meet this guy. Like it was just about how successful he was and relationships that he had built and that kind of thing. And Then I had the opportunity to meet him when Jack was, I don't know, four or five. Once I had things kind of figured out through that first phase of Jack's life. And I said to Chad, oh my gosh, you are the guy from the article. When I had a baby, there was an article in the paper about you. And I actually have it in a file at my office because you gave me hope. You, you know, were out there working and you were rocking at all these different things. I, for his privacy, I won't like tell you everything about the guy, but he's a very involved guy. And I said, you are just killing it out there. And you gave me hope. And like, he and I just totally connected. I think he felt my emotion in that moment. 
And I just totally adore him. He's my kind of people. And so he and I have have established this incredible friendship as a result of that. And so a, a few, I don't know, years into our friendship, he and I started meeting about monthly for lunch. We really need to get back on the cycle right now, by the way. But anyway, started meeting about monthly for lunch. And he works really central to downtown Cincinnati which is kind of a pain. You know, you got to park, you got to get down there, the whole thing. Downtown Cincinnati is like two miles from my office, two miles from my house. Easy for me to get to, but it's not as easy as going down to the little suburb, you know, suburban strip mall and and grabbing a Chipotle, you know, Panera or whatever. And so I was saying to my friend who is also very tied to the disability community, professionally and personally, I was saying to this friend who's very wise, you know, what's crazy is I have these monthly lunches with Chad and I have monthly lunches with other people and I cancel, you know, maybe two per year and I get canceled on maybe twice per year. He never cancels on me. I never cancel on him. And there are times that I am, I have literally parked my car and I am walking to Qdoba to meet him or wherever we are. And I'm like, oh gosh, like I have so many things to do. But every single time with 100% efficacy, I can say that every single time I have these lunches, I am just like totally refreshed. I am so happy. I am like ready to go be productive. I have wonderful productive afternoons that are full of joy. I'm much more creative in my work. I'm much more connected. And like he just totally fills my cup. And my girlfriend was like, yes, Chad fills everybody's cup. But in addition to that, she said, you know what it is, Ashley? She said, I've thought about this a lot. And she said, when you connect with somebody that has a cognitive impairment, a, a, you know, an intelligence disorder, you know, whatever, whatever you feel comfortable saying, I, I usually say cognitive impairment, but I think that, oh, I can't even think of what the federal, it's a Monday morning when I'm recording this and this is not in my notes, whatever, you know what I'm saying. When you are connecting with somebody that isn't connecting with you and isn't competing with you, and that's the word that she used that was like the big epiphany for me, isn't competing with you based on intelligence, isn't competing with you based on, you know, who has the more expensive purse or who went to the better university. There is no competition and you're not trying to impress anybody. You're not trying to be like, you know, super smart or super up to date on current events or even super empathetic. You are connecting at this visceral, soulful level. And that's what fills your cup. And I was like, you are so right. We connect at this visceral, soulful level. I don't have to have any pretenses. I don't, you know, I've gone to lunches when I used to teach at a university. I would literally read the Wall Street Journal online so that I could then go into the basically faculty lunchroom and connect with the professors and like be up to date. And of course, I enjoy reading the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and those sorts of things. But like I was doing it so that I could connect with people. And in high school, I actually got a magazine called College Sports Magazine because I like sports, A, but also it gave me something to talk to my guy friends about. It gave me a little bit of context to talk to them about. When I interact with Chad, I don't need any of that. We're talking about our families. We're talking about our experiences. We're talking about our, our work experiences, but not so much like actual work that we're doing. We're talking about how we feel about those things and the sense of pride that we get in the work that we do and the connections that we make with people at work. We're talking about this like soulful stuff. We're talking about connection and we are being real. So when my friend Carrie said that to me, I was like, that's it. That is absolutely it. And man, can we learn a lot about other relationships by just being real by connecting people by stripping away the the need to be the smartest or smarter or smart right like stripping away all those superlatives all those comparatives all of those adjectives we don't have to be that smart we don't have to be that up to date we don't have to be that aware we don't have to be that 
conservative or liberal. We don't have to be that woke. We don't have to be that informed. We don't have to be that organized. We don't have to be that fashionable. We just have to be. We just have to be real, be authentic. Oh, my God. It was like, yes, that's it. And so as I have, you know, kind of taken that humongous epiphany into the rest of my world, of course, I've taken this epiphany into work. And so, you know, sometimes things like this are really clear and sometimes they're not super clear. This is one that was not super clear. It took me a second to kind of make this connection. But something that I've always been pretty good at in negotiation is relationship building. I've always been pretty good at finding common ground. It's just kind of a neat to me. It is something that's taught, you know, finding common ground and relating to the other people in an an advocacy situation. That's something that I've always kind of like come by naturally. And when I read stuff, you know, when I read those chapters in the books, I'm always like, yes, yes, that's my language. That's what I do. That's what I'm good at, you know. So if that isn't natural to you, there's a ton of books out there and a ton of resources out there that can help you to establish those relationships. We certainly talk about it in the ABC course uh, here at Ashley Barlow Company. But as I kind of took this idea of like being real, being like viscerally connected to somebody, I thought, you know what? That's what Jack does. Jack is equivocally real. You always know what he's thinking. You always know how he feels about something, even sometimes when he doesn't. And nowadays, kind of especially when he doesn't, you can always kind of figure out what's going on. Does he like a meal and does he not like a meal? Is he feeling comfortable in a social situation? Is he not feeling comfortable in a social situation? Does he want the toy? Does he not want the toy? You always kind of know. And here's the thing. Take this to negotiation. Negotiation always has a a, a large amount of trust. So you're always kind of like sizing somebody up and the other people are always sizing you up. You know, if they're any good at their jobs, they're sizing you up. So when we talk about like negotiation, we aren't talking about some kind of, you know, bag of tricks. I think in Dale Carnegie's book, he talks about a, a bag of tricks. You know, I'm not talking about some kind of like big bag of tricks. I'm talking about real human connections. And there's all kinds of stuff about vulnerability that comes from these things. There's stuff about empathy that comes from this this concept, right? So what we're talking about is being nice, being real, being vulnerable, being honest. It's kind of like almost a new way of life in negotiation. But this strategy has been researched time after time after time. And I'm telling you, it works. We know that the opposite doesn't work. Lying doesn't work. Being arrogant doesn't work. Proving, trying to prove that you're better than somebody else doesn't work. Why not try just being real? So I was thinking as I was preparing for this podcast, about an example of something that Jack has done that is just real, right? Like, why did you do that? What did you want, right? So this is not Jack's, like, my most proud moment as as a mom. But we were at a baseball game. Jack was about, oh, I don't know, five, six years old. and And Griffin used to play baseball. And there was a set of twins. One played baseball, the other one didn't. And Jack had the attention of the twin that was not playing baseball. And this little boy is like a super sweet little boy. He was probably, you know what? They were probably like in seventh or eighth grade. And so he was a big kid, right? And Jack was a a little kid. He was, if if these boys were in seventh grade, then Jack was in, what, third grade. So he was a little kid. And Jack was so excited to have the attention of a cool middle school boy. So... And and then, by the way, the twins have a little brother as well. So the little brother, you know, Jack's playing baseball with the big kid, playing baseball, playing baseball, tossing baseball. I'm sure they were wrestling a little bit, just having a great time. And the little brother saunters over. And little brother's even younger than Jack. So what's Jack do? But he literally, like, cold smacks the guy. What do you call that? Cold, cold smack? Like, cold cocked. 
He like cold cocked the kid. I mean, just slapped him right across the face. Like, get out of here. No way. No how. No why. See you later. Just slapped him across the face. Now, remember, he's impulsive and he was aggressive for a while. But I remember that this was like not in a time period when he was behaving that way. So I asked, of course, the rhetorical that you're never supposed to ask, why did you do that? And Jack goes, because he's not my friend. Now, nice? Absolutely not. Real? You betcha it was. And so Jack and I had this really good discussion. All of a sudden, like in, in the snap of a finger, I knew that what he was saying was, I wanted to play with the big kid and the little kid walked in and he's not my friend. I was playing with my friend and he interrupted. So incredibly real. And how refreshing is that? There was no like, there was nothing to sort through. There was nothing to try to figure out. It was so, so real. Of course, in Jack's case, it was also offensive. And so we can layer on a thousand things as adults with average intelligence or with above average intelligence. We can layer on so, so much. But in Jack's world, there is so much to learn from just being real. Now, with his EU, he actually oftentimes will, you know, connect with people in this kind of soulful, visceral way. And then he'll hit you with something that's real. Something like, I don't want to do that. Or I do want to do that. Or would you do this with me? You know, and you're like, gosh, that's refreshing. There was no pretense there. We knew exactly what you were looking for. We knew exactly what you wanted. We knew exactly what you were doing the whole darn time. This realness involves such a humility. It involves such vulnerability. And it is so easy once you are just real. There he is knocking on my door. Okay. I hope that that negotiation strategy helps you. I hope you have a great week. I will see you next week. Same time, same place. Have a great week.